Good morning. Can you all hear me well? Yes. Great. I'm Dr. Richard Allen Williams. I happen to be the president of the National Medical Association. And it's my pleasure to be here as the moderator for this program this morning, uh, which is entitled The Role of Minority Serving Physicians in Creating Sustainable Healthy Communities. It's a long title. We hope to make that realistic for you and understandable in regards to the fact that uh, we're going to be talking about some very important aspects of uh, community health and uh, population health and all, all those good things are, that are so important for us in considering matters of health equity, health care disparities, etc. Uh, I'm going to make uh, just a couple of preliminary remarks before I introduce this distinguished panel that we have to uh, present to you. And I mentioned our time frame. We're going to try to cover a number of things in the course of just an hour. And we're going to leave some time for Q&A and discussion. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, at the outset, I'd, li I'd like to mention that I'd like for you to hold your questions and comments until the end of the, all of the presentations. And then we'll, as I say, uh, have some time for all of that to be taken care of. The first thing that I want to mention is that uh, we're talking today essentially about communities. And uh, even though that's an old term, the community has been a term that's been kicked around for quite a while, it's something that has come into recent, uh, more recent uh, focus regarding the fact that there are people who live in those communities, many of whom are minorities and uh, many of whom are subjected to, uh, let us say, uh, inequities in healthcare delivery. We're all about uh, a concern regarding that and uh, we're going to be approaching uh, uh, some, perhaps some expressions about those things and hopefully some uh, solutions or at least recommendations for taking care of those for the future. Uh, now, when we talk about communities, uh, that's a term that, at least from the minority perspective, is something that has been uh, approached in the past using different terminology. In the past, we've talked about ghettos, and uh, that term isn't used too much anymore. Uh, community has kind of replaced it. So uh, when you hear p folks talk about the community, or as they say in the ghetto, the community, uh, then we know what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, there was a book that was written in 1969 by an old colleague of mine who's passed on now. His name was Dr. John C. Norman, Jack Norman, who was a brilliant surgeon from uh, uh, Harvard, uh, whom I met uh, back in those days when I was also there. And it was called Medicine in the Ghetto. That book was a classic and is a classic uh, for its description of life in the community so to speak, and uh, it described uh, not only life in the community, but the crying need that there was for people to understand what the problems were that, were, that the people there confronted daily. Uh, I simply will refer you to that book. Um, there's, uh, it's available on Amazon and all of the other online, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, access points. Uh, there are other references to this, uh, to a body of work uh, regarding uh, community and in particular uh, the, uh, the health of residents of the community and how we might address these things. Uh, and I simply will mention a uh, special article which, which uh, appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, back in uh, uh, 1996, and it was called uh, The Role of Black and Hispanic Physicians in Providing Health Care for Underserved Populations. This is something that, uh, for the first time, really focused on uh, how 
uh, residents of various communities, especially those that were overwhelmingly minority, uh, were being treated by uh, health care providers and who those providers were. Uh, in the past, we've focused on the residents themselves, not really very much on those who provided the care for those residents and uh, what their responsibilities and roles were. Uh, and so this paper, which, as I said, was in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, authored initially, the initial author was uh, Komoromi, um, is recommended to you for review in regards to the things that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, there are other articles which I, I could uh, cite to you, but I won't take the time to do that now, which you might want to look at uh, from the standpoint of uh, serving as a resource on this topic. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is that uh, today we are looking at a different approach, a uh, philosophical approach to uh, problems in the community and also to the role that providers should be playing in uh, providing uh, health care for those residents. Um, one of the things that is extremely important for us to understand is that there is a focus, and this focus came about really through uh, the institution of the ACA. There's a focus on uh, the uh, on patient-centeredness, which is an important concept for all of us to keep in mind. And uh, also another term which you'll, you, you might become familiar with is a uh, democratization of health care, uh, which is uh, something that I'll leave for my colleagues here to describe to you if they want to get into that. Uh, but it's an important concept for us to keep in mind from the standpoint of the central role that the patient needs to play in our health care system and also in the doctor-patient relationship, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that we need to share the patient's care with the patient. And uh, that uh, is a, a theme that I think that you'll hear repeated uh, today in the presentations. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, begin our program by introducing our first presenter, who is uh, Dr. Christopher Holliday. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read just a few of his credentials. He's the director of Clinical Community Linkages, Improving Health Outcomes for the American Medical Association. As Director of Clinical Community Linkages, which uh, he was formerly Director of Population Health at the AMA, Dr. Holliday leads a multidisciplinary team in efforts to develop and implement national, clinical, and public health strategies for improving health outcomes and reducing costs for high-impact chronic medical conditions, such as CVD and type 2 diabetes. A uh, lot more that we could say about that, but uh, let's uh, cut to the chase and describe him as a passionate advocate for public, health, public policy, systems, and environmental change strategies that impact the social determinants of health, a very important expression, and reduces disease burden and promotes healthy lifestyles and health equity. He's a community psychologist. That's the term that you're not going to hear very often, uh, by training. And he received his uh, BA, MA, and PhD degrees in psychology from Northwestern and Georgia State Universities, and his Master of Public Health degree from Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. So without further ado, I bring to you the podium, Dr. Christopher Holliday, who is going to address you on this issue that I described to you, having to deal with minority physicians' roles in the care of underserved patients. Dr. Holliday. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and uh, glad to be here. First, I want to thank uh, Gary Puckerin and NMQF, J. Maury Johnson, Craig Johnson, all of my folks back at the AMA for this opportunity to share on this really important topic. 
Um, just a couple of housekeeping things right before I begin. There's a, a handout that's in front of each of you. Looks a little bit like this, single page. The Improving Health Outcomes group is the group that I'm part of at the AMA. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them, but this is just a little overview of the work that we're doing around cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So if you can look at that at your leisure. And then later on um, in the talk, in about 10 or, 10 or so minutes, I'll be talking about some um, uh, coding tip cards that I'm actually going to pass around. I'm just afraid of passing them around now because you'll probably be reading them while I'm talking just to keep yourself awake. Um, but uh, again, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm just going to talk to you very briefly about the work that we're doing at the AMA, specifically around health equity and how we're thinking about health equity. Um, so if I can get this to work correctly, um, I don't know where I point here. Okay, great. So uh, real briefly, I'll talk to you a little bit about the AMA's vision and values and how those support health equity, a little bit about our a background or our path to health equity, kind of the scaffolding that we hang our activities around, and then three strategic focus areas that are a central part of the work that we do at the AMA, and how the priorities of those strategic focus areas as well as opportunities within those strategic focus areas for health equity um, that I can pose to the folks here are going to be important for advancing our conversation. And then finally, looking at a little bit about how advocacy plays a major part in our work. So we talked about the social determinants of health, and this session is really around sustainability. So when we think about the, the social determinants of health, we're thinking about policy systems and environmental change. Those are the, the key drivers for sustainability. So if you can bake it into the policy structure, if you can change the environment that supports optimal health outcomes around transportation, housing, um, and so forth, then you're really changing the paradigm that's gonna to lead to improved health outcomes and reduce health inequities. So really quickly, as I move forward, um, whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> uh, no. All right, there we go. Um, so for my panelists, you push the left button to go back and the right button to go forward. <laughs> so the vision and values, um, AMA is obviously working to um, make sure that high quality, affordable care is afforded for all populations. Um, but we're also not just working um, with physicians and care teams, but we're partnering with patients to achieve better health. Our values have to support this, this vision and our values are really looking at increased access to care and coverage for vulnerable populations, but that also includes workforce diversity. I don't know if we're going to, we're probably going to hear that theme a lot throughout um, the next two days, but policy and action. I mentioned this, the um, things that sustain action long term, policy change, systems change, environmental change. So you'll hear that um, quite a bit through, the, through this conversation. So this is the, our path to health equity. So we're an over 170 year old organization. Um, but we're relatively new to health equity, as you might imagine. We have, um, because of our history, organizations, wonderful organizations like the National Medical Association, the National Hispanic Medical Association, and, and, the, and, the, and others. And that's principally because of a, of a policy of exclusion. So we're new to this game, if you will, and we're looking for the people in this room and those that across the country that have been doing this work since day one to help us to refine our thinking, to support our thinking, to advance our thinking so that we can make a credible contribution to this work. We are working with patients in priority populations and the physicians that care for them. We are increasing access to high quality care that is affordable, but we're also looking at economic policies. We're looking at social policies, political systems that support health equity. And we do this through our AMA policies. We do this through our products and our resources that we provide to physicians and care teams across the country. But also we do this as we think about how health equity is maximized. So the scaffolding, if you will, I've got a, I'm sure I've got a little pointer here. Um, this bottom section, okay, I'm not good with technology. All right, so I don't have one. So the operations, how do we, Say that again. Here. This down there, point that way. Uh, um, oh, hey, wait a minute, there, I saw one. 
There it is. All right. Can I get a round of applause? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So um, how do we, through our operations, through our strategic focus, and through our adv advocacy efforts, advance health equity? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So walking the talk, it's really important, not just because of the AMA's history, but because we want to make sure that this is happening inside as well as what we're talking about outside and talking to you externally. So walking the talk is really important. We have an enterprise-wide health equity strategy where we're thinking about the work that we do day in and day out and how we can refine it, change it, move the aperture, if you will, of the lens to to respect and honor health equity. So if we're developing products, if we are engaging physicians, if we're doing CME, if we're doing anything that supports organized medicine, how do we do that in a way that reduces disparities and improves health equity for all? So this enterprise-wide effort is taking all of the business units across the enterprise, bringing us together on a monthly, quarterly basis to say, what is it that you do that is not exacerbating the problem, but actually helping health equity to be realized. We also have a diversity and inclusion work group, and I'll just do three things because these three bullets are kind of related. Um, our old fearless leader, Jay Maury Johnson here, if you can raise your hand, uh, leads our diversity and inclusion work group, and she's taking what have previously been very fragmented DNI efforts and bringing them together in a more sustainable, robust plan. So that includes um, all of our business units, human resources, how we, how we hire, how we think about the people that are working at the AMA across gender, across race, across um, sexual orientation how we do our contracting, how we put out RFPs. Do they have a DNI a clause? Are they thinking about minority businesses, minority um, uh, consultants as we do our work? So really thinking, being thoughtful about how we do our work from a DNI perspective. And then finally, our board has a demographics form and a nominations form that is actually looking at um, how we can get personal statements from uh, uh, nominees of color, how we can hear from more of them, how we can make sure that we are incenting them to, to apply. Now, the three strategic focus areas that I'm going to talk to you about over the next few minutes are really where the priorities, but also the opportunities that I mentioned earlier are going to be important for this conversation because I really want to hear from the folks in this room around our opportunities and how you can actually help the AMA to improve its health equity game, if you will. So our first one is uh, PS2, Professional Satisfaction and Practice Sustainability. And this is really our, our, our strategic focus areas is looking at how to get physicians who are practicing to operate at the top of their license. I think there's a, a, a talk sometime today or tomorrow around operating at the type of, top of your license and what that means. But really making sure that they have the resources to navigate this very changing healthcare environment every time you turn um, the page of a newspaper, something different is happening in healthcare. How do we make sure that physicians are able to navigate this? How do we equip them and empower them to get um, improved health outcomes, which is what they want, and to do high quality care? Acceler accelerating change in graduate and undergraduate medical education. So our ACE consortium, or our ACE um, focus area, is really looking at how to transform graduate and undergraduate medical education. I'll tell you a little bit more about that group um, later. And then the group that I'm in is the Improving Health Outcomes Group. And we're looking at preventing type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and specifically those who have a usual source of care that have hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension. And that's new for uh, an organized medicine organization to folks, uh, for AMA to focus specifically on disease conditions. So let's talk about the priorities for each of these three strategic focus areas. So professional satisfaction and practice sustainability, we're really looking at how to equip, how to support, how to advance um, treatment and care for the practicing physician. We're looking at how physician burnout 
is a very real factor that we, we are hearing from physicians day in and day out as we engage them on the ground. So we actually have a way of going into clinical settings and measuring the level of burnout among physicians in a practice. So we've been called on several times to administer this assessment, this survey, this measurement tool to find out what's happening to the group of physicians that are in a particular um, system or office practice or a large integrated health system. Um, we're looking at practice transformation. We're looking at payment models. Those are changing every five minutes. Uh, we're looking at how do you optimize your electronic health records in this very real world of digital health and uh, the way that those change. How do you maximize the use of that where you can get um, uh, real quality care and time with your patients without being overwhelmed by the EHR system. And then if you look to the right, this is our Steps Forward platform. This is an uh, online platform that has over 40 modules that actually help physicians with free CME to do many of these things. And so we're very excited that this was launched last year and we've had physicians from across the country taking these modules and really learning how to, to navigate. So, so within these physicians, priorities, nurses, patients, communities all together have to find the right solutions to improve health beyond that small part of what we do with pills and education and the traditional ways in which we've approached healthcare. So that's Dr. Susan Skoshilak. She leads our Accelerating Change in Graduate Medical Education at the AMA, and she's talking about how we are supporting um, the undergraduate medical education transformation process. So she's working with students that are part of medical schools all across the country. Over 30 medical schools have come together in a consortium, and she's actually talking to them about how medical education can be transformed and looked at differently. What are the social determinants of health? How do those support or undermine your treatment plan? How, do, how does knowing whether your patients have a walkable community, access to fresh fruits and vegetables, um, coverage for care, really change um, the outcomes that you're going to be realizing once you're in practice? Um, and then the other two pieces here are refining health system science. So we have basic science, we have clinical science. There's a third science that we're calling health system science, and we're trying to teach medical students how large integrated health systems and how health systems in general operate. Many of us go into practice not really knowing how the system works. So this is a way of training, training students at the medical school um, setting about health systems. So that's a difference. And we've actually got a, a book published on that. And then identifying and disseminating admissions policies and programs to increase diversity in schools. So that's our pipeline effort to really think about how to bring more minority um, and low income and um, gender based uh, physicians into medicine. So the third priority um, under our Improving Health Outcomes group, which is the group that I work in, is really looking at how do you engage physicians and care teams around chronic disease prevention and chronic disease management and treatment. Two initiatives that I just want to highlight really quickly. The first one is Prevent Diabetes Stat. This is a, a, a actual partnership that we have with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with the National DPP, the National Diabetes Prevention Program operated out of the CDC. The CDC and the AMA have partnered around this initiative to make sure that we engage physicians and their care teams to prevent the onset of type 2 diabetes among their panel of patients. And we're doing this in a myriad of ways. There are 86 million people with prediabetes. There are about 36 million with diabetes. 90% of those people with prediabetes don't know they have the condition. So there, there's a huge awareness curve here. But what we're trying to do is start with the physician as well as with the patient to say, you have at least a third of your panel potentially has prediabetes. What we can help you with are tools and resources to, to go into your EHR, to do a registry, um, to do a look back in your enterprise data warehouse, and draw a registry of these patients, and really 
kind of go through those and make sure that they have prediabetes and then refer them to diabetes prevention programs that are right in your, in your area. And those diabetes prevention programs are not only in person, but they're virtual. So we're really helping doctors to do the clinical to community link. So clinical community linkages is a new phrase. It's actually the title of my job, but it's, a, it's something that's emerging more and more where people are talking about how do you connect patients or physicians to the, the community resources that are going to improve the health outcomes of their patients. And so this is one of those resources, the Diabetes Prevention Program. The other program that we're leading is our hypertension control program. And this is an example of actually one of my staff members here um, who his, his image has been kind of sent across the world around the seven uh, simple steps to get an accurate blood pressure reading. And we use this map framework that says measure accurately. So if you can do these seven simple steps to measure a blood pressure, and you'll be surprised at how many practicing physicians and care team members do not take an accurate blood pressure. But this kind of gives you an example. Then having, um, once you determine that someone has an elevated blood, uh, blood pressure um, or has hypertension, acting rapidly. That's the A part of the map. And then the P part is really partnering with that patient and that patient family to, to manage and to get that hypertension under control. So that's our last uh, st strategic focus area. So this is the most important part of, of this work, um, is how we engage physicians. Um, we, we do it, and this is again under Jay Morey's leadership, by creating a more inclusive culture by engaging partners like the folks in this room, NMQF, NMA, um, SNMA, NHMA, LM, LMSA, um, and really helping us to think about what uh, is happening in context. How are patients um, able to or not able to navigate the, the health system? What are the pain points? What are the reasons why there's a lack of medication adherence in a particular population or in a particular cohort of patients? Why are there things that are happening um, that you're experiencing and then help us to think about those at the AMA so that we can partner with you around creating tools, resources, and other things that will help to reduce these inequities? Listening. Um, I'm going to say that twice, listening to and addressing the needs of physicians who actually care for these patients. More often than not, um, we talk about uh, the vulnerable, the underserved, the patients who are um, the least of these, but we don't often talk about the physicians that are most likely to care for these patients, and those are the physicians that are in this room, the physicians that we encounter that look like these patients. So helping to list having an opportunity to actually listen to the patients, to, to the physicians. And Jay Mori actually did a, I think it was a nationwide tour, listening tour of physicians across the country to help us to really be thoughtful about our tools and resources that we offer to physicians. Um, and then the last one is providing educational programs and policy making venues that advance health equity. And I'll talk about that very shortly. So this, this piece is important. So these are the opportunities where I need your input, I need your lens, I need your thinking, and, and those of your constituents across the country to really help us to refine what we're doing at the AMA. So I mentioned the Steps Forward online module that helps us, helps many physicians to get CME and learn about practice transformation, quality improvement activities, and the like. We also have um, resources there that we're creating solutions for burnout, for under-resourced practices, but we need to hear from under-resourced practices or physicians in those settings to help refine this tool. We're working with FQHCs um, to transform their practices, so we need to hear from physicians that are operating in FQHCs, creating materials for physicians that illustrate the business case for health equity. And then finally, the tools um, and resources piece is really important. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned earlier are these coding um, um, tips or coding cards. And here's a couple of visual examples. One specifically on internal medicine and family medicine. And this is for ICD-10, many of the under-resourced um, uh, practices and clinical settings across the country only have ICD-9. So we have some, some coding tips and then how to build a code specifically around diabetes, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and so forth. And then finally, the opportunities for ACE 
are really are really pretty broad. So education is a really key factor in building the pipeline of, of physicians across the country that are not only going to understand the social determinants of health, that are not only going to be able to treat chronic disease, but they are going to be treating the people who are most um, likely impacted by uh, these things. So transforming medical school curriculum, we have some interest groups around chronic disease management and prevention, social determinants of health. Those are open to the public. You can join those interest groups. We need to hear your voices. Um, facilitate faculty development activities that focus on quality improvement principles, emphasizing the value students provide to health systems. And here's that health system science book, The Third Science, that just came out. It's now being used by many medical school, schools as a part of the curriculum. And then opportunities that are fall within my group. So again, we are looking at how we just received an art grant that talks about examining decisions of new physicians to locate in underserved and low income locations. What promotes that? What are the, what are the incentives for that? How do we increase that? Um, identifying among ambulatory care settings, variation in blood pressure control rates across race and ethnicity. We're specifically looking at hypertension among African American men and how to get uh, a handle on that. Uh, developing approaches on how hospitals can use their community benefit dollars to support the diabetes prevention program, for example, or support self-monitoring blood pressure devices to their patients. And All right, and so my time is running out. Um, here are a couple of other um, last two slides, our opportunity with our physician engagement group, um, Doctors Back to School, I think many of you have participated in those, our, minor, our um, uh, minority student section, national service project, educational materials that we're developing for the business case, and then uh, grassroots efforts. Now, finally, is our advocacy piece. I, I told you about this in the beginning, so I'll skip through these last two slides very quickly, but we have some very basic principles that we, we feel are not um, for question around particularly the health reform, the, AM, the AHA, and now soon the AHCA, that we ensure that individuals currently covered do not become uninsured, maintain key insurance market reform, so pre-existing conditions, guaranteed issue, parental coverage of young adults, we think those are un- um, questionable tenets and principles that we have to stand by as the AMA as we advocate here in DC. Stabilize and strengthen the individual insurance market, ensure how low to moderate income patients are able to secure affordable and meaningful coverage and so forth. Um, and, and it goes on, including uh, greater cost transparency um, throughout the healthcare system. And then finally, um, Patients Before Politics is a new initiative we just launched last month that actually helps us to advocate and helps you to advocate. You come to patientsbeforepolitics.org. We have the latest issues that are happening on the Hill, whether it could be district specific. Um, if you want to get involved, that's a way for your patients as well as you as providers to get involved. And then obviously the last piece is really advancing health equity by looking at the QPP under MACRA advocating for new payment models that, ensure, uh, that achieve better health outcomes, higher quality, lower spending trends, um, ensuring these new models work for under-resourced practices and vulnerable and complex patients. I cannot underscore that enough. And then finally, public health campaigns, working with the American Bar Association and others to really get our arms around health equity. So we can't do this alone. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holliday. We'll have um, some Q&A later. Pardon my wearing the glasses. The lights irritate my eyes. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Daniel Wolfson. Dr. Wolfson is Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the ABIM Foundation a not-for-profit foundation focused on advancing medical professionalism and physician leadership to improve the health care system. Uh, very significantly, he served for nearly two decades as the founding president and CEO of the Alliance of Community Health Plans, which was formerly the HMO Group, the nation's leading association of not-for-profit and provider-sponsored health plans. And also very significantly, during his tenure, Mr. Wolfson earned national recognition 
for spearheading the development of the Health Plan Employee Data and Information Set, or HEDIS. So this is where HEDIS comes from. Uh, without further ado, let me bring to the podium Mr. Daniel Wolfson. Thank you. Honor to be here. Um, I'm going to go fast because um, I'm really here to ask you um, your advice on the Choosing Wisely campaign and how we involve the minority community in that campaign. Um, anybody here of the Choosing Wisely campaign? Could you raise your hand if you've heard it, about it? So not a lot of people. Hmm. So I have my work cut out for me. I am going to talk about, um, describe the problem, uh, why I'm on the podium about you know, sustainability and health care, um, and then talk about our approach to choosing wisely, and then raise some questions uh, regarding whether there is overuse in the minority populations. And then, um, if I can convince you, um, how do we involve or not involve the minority population in this campaign? Um, so that, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through these slides real quick, but the Choosing Wisely campaign uh, was originated by this gentleman, um, Dr. Brody, and it, it essentially said, have the specialty societies name five things where the risks outweigh the benefits or overuse or unnecessary care. And we started out, um, the person next to, next to me is the head of Consumer Reports, and they've been a partner with us on this a campaign from the very beginning. So the ABIM Foundation was focused on the physician community and Consumer Reports was focused on the consumer employer population and developed a coalition. Um, and that coalition I think has weaknesses and I want to talk to you about them. But we started out with nine and then we grew to 75 and we have non-physician organizations including nurses uh, in, in, in the fold and then we have these 70 consumer, uh, 70, uh, consumer report partners and distributors, and we have um, 490 recommendations and 120 patient-friendly brochures. And this uh, Choosing Wisely is in 19 countries. All call themselves Choosing Wisely, Choosing Wisely Australia, so on and so forth. So it's been a kind of a viral movement. It's appeal to physicians, professional values, and it's appeal to patients because they feel like they have a say in this as well. So it's, this is all about um, developing conversations between patients and physicians and supporting them. And this was the document that we used to support our campaign and all the work of the EBIM Foundation. And you can see something that was not written in the Hippocratic Oath, and that was social justice. And, and this campaign was based on the just distribution of, of resources. So why am I up here? Because I think there's a sustainability issue when each year you waste $250 billion on things that are not necessary. Um, many organizations have said it's 30% of care in America is, over, is not necessary. So what does that mean? That means that we don't put money into health. We don't, that's money we don't put it in education. That's money we don't put in infrastructure. So I think that's why I'm up here today. And this is what we learned. I'm not going to go through um, most, most of this, um, but I can assure you that messaging is really important for a campaign. When we started out, they were talking about rationing and death panels, and we really um, tried to make this campaign not about cost, but about better care. Um, let me go back. Um, and we've really found that bottom-up um, support for things is really worthwhile, both with the patient community and the physician community. If you try to do things uh, from a high, of course you need support. You really don't get too far too fast. Got a lot of publicity particularly in the beginning. And so on the right-hand side is the Choosing Wisely recommendations and uh, literacy of uh, fifth, sixth grade, probably not low enough, um, done by Consumer Reports in conjunction with the 80 specialty societies. Each one of them 
was branded with this. They signed off on this. On the left side is what we present to physicians. Five things. They're not absolutes. There are indications where uh, you would want to do something. Uh, lower back pain, don't do it. Um, uh, don't do a CT scan before six weeks unless there's a red flag, um, incontinence, so on. So there's not, these are not absolutes. But uh, the things on the right-hand side were really um, what we b began to put in the hands of consumers. This is also in Spanish and uh, some other languages as well. Uh, so this is what we asked them, uh, the, the special societies to do, uh, based them on evidence, based them on frequent use, evidence-based and transparent. Those are the simple rules we gave them. We allowed them to do uh, what they wanted to as far as the methodology goes. And so the methodology is irregular, uh, but we thought um, empowering the specialty societies and engaging them. This is very much an engagement strategy of physicians taking leadership and, physic and patients taking leadership in, in what we thought was an important movement. This is a card that Consumer Report puts out five questions that patients should ask. What are my options? Are there other things I should be doing? What's the cost? And you can see some of the, um, uh, and by the way, just not to put consumer uh, reports down, but if you look at the uh, demographics of consumer reports, it's mainly white, it's mainly um, affluent, and it's mainly between 40 and 65. So its demographics are pretty awful. Um, in, a, in, a, in a sense, but they're a trusted name. Um, you know, they're a nonprofit. I always say that Consumer Reports uh, doesn't even um, get the refrigerators they evaluate through the manufacturer. They go out and buy it in the store. So squeaky clean, but demographics are awful. Um, so uh, we've involved AARP, National Business Group on Health, Leapfrog Group, Wikipedia is the biggest source of information in America for consumers, and we have a fellow that goes in and edits um, Wikipedia to reflect choosing wisely recommendations. So this is our website. We have lots of resources there for you to, to see. We have 100, uh, 1.5 million clinicians and patients and caregivers going to the choosingwisely.org site. And there is a consumer site as well. If you go to con Healthy uh, Consumer Reports, you'll see all their materials as well. So I really want to, I'm sorry I'm flipping, um, but I want to get to um, what I think is the heart of the matter. Um, so we have uh, grants um, from uh, uh, seven uh, grantees that represent 14 delivery sites. So I want to show you what some safety net hospitals have done um, to reduce utilization. Um, and this is uh, LA County. It's a huge county hospital. I think it's the se second biggest safety uh, net hospital in the country, probably the world. And it has reduced utilization significantly. Um, and things that um, that probably you don't need and probably potentially harm you or provide radiation that you don't need. Also, it, it happened with Detroit, Detroit Medical Center in, in, in downtown Detroit. Again, impressive 54% reduction in antibiotics. Now, you might say that the cost of antibiotics is low, but it also um, has an influence on hospital infection rates. So these are the things that kind of have worked. But let me, let me get into uh, what I think is the heart of the matter for this group, and that is, is there overuse in the minority population? We've been talking about underserved populations, and now we're talking about overuse in the minority population? I don't get it. So um, some things that I, I wanted to refer to, and, um, and two studies, and, and, and the, the amount of a study of this issue 
um, my, among minority populations. We've been searching for literature, um, and I couldn't find any until literally last week. Um, and I'm going to have you think about what those studies say and whether th they have face validity. So one study, which I thought was very good, was done by Yale. Um, and it was some focus groups asking patients about um, low value care. I hate the word low value care. I think it's not, not the best term, but a lot of people do use high value, low value uh, care. And it said uh, during one of their conclusions of this study, and this is American understanding of and responses to low value care in Millbank, if anybody's interested. And the author is a very good researcher, Mark Schlesinger from, from Yale. He's a very good researcher. And, he, and he's, he, the, the, one of the major findings is, is that one third of Americans have difficulty envisioning benefits from avoiding low value care. A figure that increases to half for, and this is his words, not mine, less educated minority respondents. Most Americans who anticipate benefits hope that less testing and treatment will be replaced by more interactive, personalized care. They wanted time to talk to their physicians. That's what they valued the most, actually, in this, in this, uh, in this study. Um, if you, if you want to talk about labs and tests, that um, gets away from you talking to me about how I'm feeling, how I'm coping, and my stress. And then just last week, um, there was a study in JAMA Internal Medicine that looked uh, at overuse of 12 of the Choosing Wisely recommendations. And, and I thought the, the, um, the, the results were astounding. I mean, I was just shocked. That study said no difference in uninsured, uninsured commercial populations, Medicare, and in Medicaid. Now, the reason why I'm astonished by the study is that it used uh, the National Ambulatory and Hospital Surveys. So what's wrong with that? It's only people who are in the system. You don't get counted if you're outside the system for those surveys. So if you're in the system, you're going to get treated like everybody else. But if you're not in the system, you are obviously being underserved. And to think that there's no difference between these populations on overuse, I think, is kind of drawing a wrong conclusion. Um, but I do think that people who enter the system get overused, I mean, services that are unnecessary. But you've got to be in the system to be treated, overutilized, overuse and to receive high value services because they looked at high value services as well and that was equal among all the populations as well. So, um, so let me leave you. I, I think I spent my 15 minutes. Um, and I want to ask you how we get the minority population involved in this campaign because I do think there's overuse. And I think it's a waste. It's a waste of money. It's, a, it's diverting important resources. Um, we have tried to reach out um, to minority organizations. And I think, uh, I think they scratched their head and said, overuse? We have underuse. We're underserved. We don't want to be involved in a campaign that is focused on overuse. But I think that I, I would like to say, let's have a dialogue about that. Let's have a conversation. I, I do think that there is a role for the more minority population to be involved in this campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wolfson. It's a very provocative presentation, and I'm sure that uh, there will be many people who might want to ask questions and make comments about that. But we're going to move on at this point. Uh, 
Sorry. To our next speaker, who is Patricia May Doikos. Dr. Doikos is director of the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, whose mission is to promote health equity and to improve the health outcomes of populations disproportionately affected by serious diseases and conditions. She works on strategy, evaluation, communications, and organizational development, wow, for the foundation overall, and currently leads two national grant programs, Specialty Care for Vulnerable Populations and Together on Diabetes, Communities Uniting to Meet America's Diabetes Challenge. She's also developed and led U.S. and international grant making and public-private partnership programs for global HIV AIDS, women's health, cancer, and serious mental illness. Currently, she chairs the board of the Center for Health Equity at Dartmouth Geisel Medical School, her alma mater, and serves on the board of grant makers <clears throat> in health and the Cancer Moonshot Diverse Communities Working Group. That's quite a full program, Dr. Doikos. So without further ado, I'll bring you to the podium and let you explain all that to the audience. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, we're so pleased to, to be here representing the foundation. We've had a long-standing partnership with NMQF through a number of initiatives, so we're really happy to share some of the work that we're doing now and get some of your guidance going forward. So this is just a bit of an introduction to the foundation. Dr. Williams told you our mission, which is health equity focused, and these are our programs around the world. Um, we support returning veterans for reintegration into civilian life as well as their families. We have two uh, cancer initiatives, one lung cancer in the U.S. focused on the tobacco belt, so going right in on where the epidemiology is for that. Specialty care is a pan-cancer initiative, also looking at cardiovascular disease. Down the road, we'll be getting into more rare diseases like genetically determined diseases and fibrotic diseases, where a lot of the innovation is going and ensuring that communities are not left out of those innovations. And then type 2 diabetes, a national initiative, really looking at what the patient does outside of the clinic. So diabetes self-management education, and then that, when patients have the information, then having supportive resources in their community so they actually, actually act on the information. Central and Eastern Europe, we work on cancer nursing. We've been in Sub-Saharan Africa since 1999 on HIV and have moved with the aging population in terms of their needs and also um, the generation of children who have survived and are thriving, living with HIV, their needs going for us forward. And in China and India, we focus on hepatitis. So this is our approach. Sorry for the small print. I get excited when I start thinking about what we do. Um, and we, we come to this approach in our work really guided by our grantees and what they tell us they need from a funder. So the areas of work for us are outreach, engagement on health equity. We talk to medical leadership. We work across sectors. Um, we look at complementary and reinforcing efforts around community development and social justice as well. We look to do accountable grant making, most importantly, focusing on vulnerable and medically underserved populations with their involvement in partnership. And this is one of the core lessons from HIV for us, that there needs to be a person who is affected at every table, at every level, guiding programs, watching them, helping to implement them as well. So this is a core principle for us. We look to support innovation in R&D and health equity, so we're looking for those innovators in this space and the new models of care and support that they are proposing. Um, we work on health system strengthening. Um, like Dr. Holliday, we focus on clinic community partnerships, looking at social determinants of health and also social determinants of equity. Um, we mobilize communities and community strengths to fight diseases and promote health, and we're very focused on measurement. We come from an R&D organization, so we're always looking at, at the end of the day, for all the funding, for all the effort, for all the training, for all the communications, what's the change in health outcomes? 
So that's where we are held ourselves to. We provide technical assistance on policy and advocacy. Harvard Law School is our partner on that. And we also now are evolving to get into discussions with the payers, and FSG is our partner to help us and our grantees individually to go to the health plans that cover the lives of their, their patients and start to talk to them about these innovative models of care and what would it take for them to change codes, to open up community development, what are the resources that they can bring when we have developed uh, more effective models of care. And then sharing and spreading knowledge, we create a community with our grantees, I just came from our, our national summit last week. Dr. Kamara Jones was our keynote. And uh, yes, she brought the house down, as you can imagine. <laughs> Um, and Dr. Ed Partridge from UAB and the Deep South um, Cancer Network was also there and brought the house down as well. So um, a wonderful opportunity for our grantees. And then also just speaking out. So we, we um, speak to the issues that we work on with others, joining voices. We look to do publications, presentations. Um, we talk to policymakers and health leadership. And then we try and lean on our peer foundations to um, do similar kind of work and to collaborate. So just to give you an example of one of the programs that comes um, under this work is this one that I am leading now. Um, and the goal is to improve access and utilization of specialty care for the vulnerable populations. And we're working currently in, the, in cancers, HIV, and cardiovascular disease is a new area for us. In this initiative, we try and do two things, health system strengthening, and in the specialty care place, space, it's really about collaborations between specialists and community-based providers, primary care as well. So on the one hand, and then patient engagement support and support. So getting after the social determinants of health, getting after the barriers that keep patients from coming into care to start with, completing care, under, understanding the self-care components, so supporting them on that as well. And what we look to fund is projects that put these two together. So both the health system strengthening and the patient support. And then we're very committed to ensuring that at the end of the day, these are not nice experiments or projects or programs, but that they have a life beyond. So that's why we do all of our sustainability work. So in the cancer space, I'm sure you're familiar with these kinds of statistics, but this is where we start, and I'm sure many of you do in your work as well. Um, so looking at, at females for the all cancer um, sites, uh, both incidents and death. We see African-American women and with the red uh, line are uh, less affected, have, have less incidence, but higher mortality. Same for males. All cancers, red line, African-American men, incidence, and death rate. Lung cancer. Our company works a lot on lung cancer, so we want to make sure we're looking at that too in the foundation. So we see for, for women, African-American women smoke less and are, are less affected by lung cancer than white women, but when it comes to death rates, right together. And then here we have lung cancer incidence and mortality for African-American males, red line, way above, and continues to be way above as well for the death rates. So this is where we start with our work. So what do we do about it? And how do we support our grantees to respond to those kinds of statistics? There's a number of approaches that we take and, and we look to support different ways of going after these issues with our grantees. One is to really hone in on high risk populations. So it is a new day in lung cancer. There's new screening guidelines and there's also new treatment. When innovations come, we don't want to have the typical innovation narrative of it gets to the last community's last. How can we flip that so that it comes, that innovations come equitably to communities, whether it is a public health innovation, whether it's a new treatment, whether it's a data analytics, whatever it is, how can we really look at where the, the need is most and be there with um, support so that infrastructure and services can be built. So in Harlem, we work with La the Ralph Lauren Cancer Center with their lung screening initiative. They're very well established in breast and colorectal and prostate, so this is just some resources that they needed to get the lung cancer screening program going on in continuum of care. We know for skin cancer that Hispanic farm workers have the highest um, mortality for melanoma. They have twice the risk of melanoma and highest mortality, not only because of the sun, but also because of the pesticides they're using. So farm worker justice is our partner there working on the farms, 
also with migrant health clinics and then with two NCI comprehensive cancer clinics centers to get the continuum of care going as well. So that's one way, high-risk populations. And then how can we move these big networks of cancer care providers to focus on equity and do something about it? About 70% of cancer treatment is provided in the community. So we went to the Association of Community Cancer Centers and asked them to look at how well their membership is doing for Medicaid patients with lung cancer. And they saw all kinds of problems along the way. So they decided to um, develop a project which will define the optimal care coordination model for Medicaid patients. It's being piloted now at five of their sites, and then it can be run through the ACCC um, quality improvement work. More quality improvement as well. Sometimes um, there are innovations that improve care that just stay in the setting where they were innovated and they don't spread. And we seek to do that in our support of Anne Arundel Medical Center, which for lung cancer um, reduced the time from a suspicious finding and imaging until treatment from over 60 days down to 16 days. But they did it in their pilot only for the easy to reach who was in the system. And so our challenge to them was to think about, given that Prince George's County is right next to them, Calvert County as well, heavy African-American populations, high smoking rates, to teach community hospitals and FQHCs to do this as well. So it's a mentoring partnership that they have. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, I'm sure you're very familiar with them. They are just waking up to equity as something that they need to do something about. So they have a whole pursuing equity initiative and now nine um, health systems are part of their first pilot to look at two clinical areas where they can improve their equity and also two social areas. So not just social determinants of health, but how hospitals, how health system organizations, what they're doing inside, as Dr. Holliday was talking about, and outside as well. So how are they an economic engine for the community beyond being a healthcare provider and how can they use that power to bring greater economic equity to their community as well? High-risk patient preferences. We have a partnership with Washington AIDS um, partnership here in DC. DC is very committed to the 90-90-90 goal for eliminating HIV. So 90% screened and tested, 90% in care, and 90% at below detectable levels to finally eliminate HIV. And as they looked at this, they saw that a certain population, those who had fallen out of care but who had been long on antiretrovirals, were the drivers of, infect of infections and that they had certain preferences, which were home-based care and also being uh, treated in the community. Some of them see their behavioral health um, professionals more often, so they wanted care to be brought there. So this was an effort with them. And then there's a lot of statewide initiatives now for bringing lung cancer screening into play. Um, and in the state of Maine, there were a lot of little pieces happening, but none of it was coordinated. And a lot of people don't think of Maine as an unhealthy state, but just look at any of the CDC maps, and um, as we were discussing earlier, you can tack them right into Appalachia in the Deep South. They have the same kind of outcomes there. So this was an opportunity to bring together their prevention, screening, and treatment services within Maine. They're doing a lot of work on workflows and practice improvement as well, because you can have all the guidelines you want. If it can't be implemented in your practice, it doesn't really uh, help you that much. So just hammering through those issues. And then finally, um, Project ECHO for Cancer Care. This is one of our big partnerships with NMQF and the Cancer Moonshot. Uh, Project ECHO is not so much a telehealth as a telementoring and a collaborative care model developed at the University of New Mexico by Dr. Sanji Varura for uh, HIV, I mean for, for hepatitis C, and um, really responded to the demand to bring more specialty skills to the community setting. And through Project ECHO's work in Hep C, they were able to upskill community-based providers to deliver the same level of care and same outcomes as those at a UNM specialty center. And now this is, that was 13 years ago, now they've spread to many other specialties. Cancer was an outlying area, so we're supporting them to work with the NCI Comprehensive Cancer Centers to mobilize that network, which doesn't have a lot of pressure um, on it in terms of health equity doesn't have to do a lot of things to be qualified as an NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center, but this is a wonderful way to mobilize them. 
So the thing that I will leave you with, this is just a resource. Um, as you know, having worked in HIV, diabetes, big population, high priority diseases, when we started to move into the cancer space and more specialty areas, we saw that that community of medical professionals are not as educated, mobilized, or see themselves as having a role in health equity. So part of what we wanted to do was just provide information on one, just so you know, this is what the inequities that are out there and that are um, perpetuated by specialty care. These are some things that you can do about it. And this is a way to collaborate with others in the social justice and health equity movement. So FSG is our partner in developing these. Um, the briefs go to ensuring high quality care, including culturally competent care, increasing specialty care availability, things like Project ECHO, and helping patients to engage in the care, so really getting after the social determinants of health and the social determinants of equity. There are over 30 case studies of effective programs and interventions, and they're available on our website as well as the FSG website as well. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Dr. Doikos. Well, we've had some very stimulating presentations from our panelists, and uh, I think we're now ready and uh, hopefully able to have five minutes, is that right, Chris, of um, Q&A. And uh, I'd certainly invite every member of the audience, or all, many members of the audience, to ask questions and make comments. Do we have a microphone handy? Uh, that we can move around for people who might want to ask questions. Okay, there's a question back here. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, Could you introduce yourself? My name is Alice Coons and I. Oh, Alice. Okay. What I wanted to address is called notion of low value care. And you came up with a reasonable, I was waiting for your conclusion, which I'm sure there is no evidence right now. Space is not necessarily sensitive to um, the subset of populations, for instance, the PSA. So that we heard last year from the task force regarding uh, the PSA not being a good test, and then they retracted that recently in the last few weeks, saying that, oh no, PSA should be done. And looking at the subset of populations, especially African American males, um, how do you reconcile the changing paradigm for some of the recommendations and how they wind up in the, in the, this big, this big uh, co collection of low value care? That's one thing. And the second thing is. Before we go into the second thing, let's address that one first, Alice. Okay. And who would you like to direct that question um, to? Yes. <laughs> Me. Um, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's not. I think that's an absolutely correct statement. Um, the recommendations are um, population-wide and don't divide the populations by uh, geographic area or, or, or minority status. Um, like one size fits all? Pardon me? Is it one size fits all, it's, do you think? It is one size fits all, but there's an out. I mean, we're not saying these are absolutes. PSA testing is recommended, not recommended, but it's recommended to have a conversation with your doctor to make a choice. So I always fall back on that notion that these are not absolutes and it involves a discussion of preferences, uh, you know, back uh, your history, so on and so forth. So you're right, but I think we have an out that says we need to have conversations between patients and physicians. But if we had the research, the specialty societies would use it. I'm not sure we have a good research that would determine what not to do. Uh, they had a hard enough time doing it on a population basis. And it would be great if we could do that. And I would love to work with you to do that. Thank you very much. And then just to say, I, I enjoyed all three presentations. And uh, the last presentation spoke to the need to be very uh, comprehensive and deal with multiple areas. And I like the multi-pronged approach that um, you have. But I just want to encourage each of you to consider that low value care 
can also be abstention from proper and appropriate care as well. And the discussion around low value care seems always to be focused on overutilization and not underutilization. Very good. Well, I, I have an answer to that because I've been working for 30 years on underuse and we, um, we've totally ignored overuse. And um, we've been criticized for not doing um, underuse. And my recommendation was that we, we got to focus. You can't have a campaign that's on overuse and underuse and get your message across. So we, we have had a system, a FIFA system, at least for the advantaged, that has revved up use to a, to a point that we're spending $3 trillion on health care and 30% is waste. We, we need to do something about that. And our solution was just to focus on that. Um, Consumer Reports does tell consumers about what they should do. But I think the physicians are so hooked on technology and overreach of, of medicine um, with, I think, some false promises about what medicine can and can't do that we really wanted to focus on overuse and not cloud the message with underuse because we've been focusing on it. That's why we developed HEDIS so we could focus on underuse, but we never did anything. There was never any measures on overuse, and we still don't have good measures on overuse. If I can possibly intervene uh, in that conversation very briefly, um, I would suggest that maybe there's a, a feeling of sort of a disconnect between um, a, uh, a focus on um, overuse and uh, considerations of uh, health care delivery uh, and problems in the minority community. Uh, it just doesn't seem to, uh, the, the problem of overuse just doesn't seem to fit into the equation when you're talking about health care equity in uh, the community and so forth. Uh, and so this is a new paradigm that uh, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Wolfson is, is trying to uh, uh, focus on, but it's something that perhaps doesn't quite come across to those of us who have for so long been concerned about underuse uh, in the community in regards to procedures, et cetera, and we've got several examples of that. So I think that that's something that we can't solve here, but it's something that I would encourage everybody to think about uh, why we should be concerned about uh, this $250 billion uh, dollar overuse uh, situation as being at least in part applicable to uh, overuse in, in uh, the community. Yes, uh, question? Oh, hi, Joya. Hey, Dr. Williams. Good morning, everybody. So I am Dr. Joya Creer Perry. I have the honor of being on the board of the National Medical Association with our president here, Dr. Williams. I'm also on the Board of Community Catalyst with Mark Schlesinger. So when you brought up his name, I, of course. So um, <laughs> thinking about what you just talked about, this overuse, underuse, and the study you brought up from JAMA, it really is a great opportunity for us to talk about how we can work together. Because you mentioned in your speech about framing. And so how it's framed is that the minority community overutilizes. And what the study shows is that's just not true. That when you get into the system, the system overutilizes, and we don't control the system. In fact, we don't control a lot. So, if there's an opportunity for partnership, is really in using that message to reframe what how people view us, and how people view how we use the system, and to be more accurate and honest about that, and then to say underutilization occurs because we're not brought into the system, and everybody who's in it is overutilizing, not just us. Excellent point. So let's move on. Thank you very much, Joya. Question back here, and can we take the microphone there so that she can be heard? And I know that we don't have much more time, so. And I'm a physician who cares for patients, um, subspecialty care uh, in hematology. Could you talk into the mic so that All right, right here? that's better. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Diane Nugent, and I come from the Center for Inherited Blood Disorders in Southern California. We have moved subspecialty care out into the community-based clinic network. Mm -hmm. And I really want to speak to the hope that we can promote moving subspecialty care to the community because it will engender huge cost savings. 
uh, a lot that's going on right now with that $250 billion is the fact that a lot of our clinics are being held in the hospital footprint mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. stepping out of the hospital alone and partnering, as many of you have said, with our community providers is gonna save an, a lot of money. And it's not just for everyday disorders. I take care of sickle cell hemophilia. We can keep patients out of the hospital by doing this. Part of my big challenge is that there is not alignment with healthcare entities like hospitals in doing this. And secondly, is reimbursement for physicians, which Chris, you talked about. Mm -hmm. And um, getting physicians to come and work in the community as a hematologist is almost an insurmountable feat. But I think two things that we can lobby and advocate for is loan repayment. And I could, I, I have, can't tell you how many times I've lost great physicians who had the heart, what we call the nonprofit heart, which is where we work, but just said, I cannot afford to do this. My loans are too great. And I think that we really need to speak to that because anyone who wants to work in a community-based clinic is not doing it for the money. Uh, so, and secondly, being able to talk to our patients does prevent hospitalizations, will drive down costs, but we can't do that when the FQHC's guideline is for us to see f one provider 4,200 patient encounters per year. Absolutely. So we need to really change how we reimburse physicians, not just physicians, nurse providers, everybody, for the time they spent for good outcomes. And believe me, I am totally behind everybody who said that our populations are not overusing our healthcare systems. In Southern California, we estimate 5,000 patients with sickle cell. We're seeing less than 600 in centers of excellence. It's really important that we get the physicians and providers to understand how to take care of these disorders. So Thank are you, you suggesting that maybe uh, the methodology of use might need to be altered rather than uh, considering that this is a problem of overuse? Thank you. Okay, any questions? Uh, we have time for maybe two other brief questions uh, for on other issues other than overuse, underuse. Uh, do you have one? Yes, sir. Bring the microphone up here, please. And introduce yourself, sir. Uh, sure, sure. I'm Ken Bridges. I'm with Global Blood Therapeutics. But I just had a quick uh, question for Dr. Halliday. Uh, you mentioned uh, prediabetes, and, uh, which is really important in addressing some of those issues, how do you get physicians. Uh, and part of that, of course, has to do with uh, things like nutrition, obesity, which, circling back to your uh, emphasis on medical schools and medical school education, medical schools don't really talk about nutrition. They don't really talk about those issues. I was just wondering what, ha uh, what you've seen in your response as you've tried to get into this uh, area. Sure, sure. Excellent. So thank you for that question. Terrific question. That is actually one of the, the main things that came up as part of our consortium of medical schools. So I mentioned the interest groups or the interest work groups that have developed as part of that consortium. And one of them is really about how to talk about lifestyle change as part of undergraduate medical education. Um, the diabetes prevention program that I mentioned earlier uh, that um, we are working with the, the CDC around is about lifestyle change. So it's, it's really about how do you get people through their normal course of the day moving more and eating better and really thinking about that in a modest weight loss, five to seven percent of the body weight and then getting more access to fresh fruits and vegetables and, and really thinking about their lifestyle differently. But it's within the context of how they live day to day. So it's really thinking about the, the patient in context, and so the students have been talking about this because this is not a consortium of just medical school leaders. The students are part of these work groups, and they're talking about if, you, if I have a, a pathology test or pathology lab, and I have, um, a, as an example, um, a, a concurrent um, um, 
uh, class that talks about lifestyle change, I'm going to do what I'm going to be rated highest on. So we, we've talked about how do we equalize the, the, the importance of these types of classes, because those are going to be the things that we're going to need to know for the future to support this, um, uh, this mounting chronic disease epidemic that we're in. So, so nutrition, physical activity, all of those things that we talk about as far as lifestyle change, changes are actually being thought about being put as, as, as formative, um, uh, high impact parts of medical curriculum. So you'll be seeing that in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, time for one last question. The gentleman in the rear there with his hand up. Sorry? We'll, we'll take them all. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. Uh, Leanne Roberts from Michigan. Um, again, thank you for all of your comments. And I wanted to refocus on education and training um, for medical students and residents. And this question is probably more pertinent uh, to Dr. Holliday. Um, from an organizational standpoint at the AMA and some of the other organizations that you work with, um, do you have any advice on how to get other organizations and institutions to commit to making sure that there is diversity in the training pipeline, um, especially as a core tenant in eliminating or addressing healthcare disparities. I'm saying that as a graduating obstetrics and gynecology resident in Detroit, Michigan, and there are 40 residents in my obstetrics and gynecology program. And after I graduate, along with two of my other colleagues, um, and we lovingly call each other the last of the Mocahicans, um, because Mocha. there will be no black OBGYN residents in our training program serving a predominantly black community. So if you can just talk about any strategies um, that you may have in getting that institutional buy-in to really commit to getting that diversity back in the pipeline. Right, that's, right. A, that's a heavy question, heavyweight question, and I'm going to ask for a brief response. I don't have a brief response. Challenge, <laughs> challenge your... Let me think about a brief response. Yes, we're working on that. Um, so... <laughs> That's so good. so the AMA, along with the Consortium of Medical Schools, and then we've talked about the uh, medical st uh, student section of the AMA, as well as the women's physician section and others, are really being thoughtful in how to increase um, diversity in the pipeline. So we talked about doctors back to school introducing medicine and the, and the sciences early to, um, to students in elementary all the way through to undergraduate and graduate medical education. But the retention piece, which I think is to the heart of your question, question is, is, a, is a lasting problem and it's an issue that we're thinking about strategies around um, around incentives for um, for um, low in, I'm sorry for minority students um, I can point to um, our own Jay Mori Johnson I've called her name about five times today she is the lead in this work and she um, you can talk to her afterwards this is supposed to be a short answer but these will also be at the table at the AMA table and she can give you more of those strategies excellent well, I think we've had a great program. Uh, hope that uh, everybody uh, maintains your interest in this this uh, problem, this program, this uh, issue. And I'd like to give a round of applause to our pal panelists who have uh, been great in regards to what they presented. And just remember that. Uh, we started out talking about minority physicians' <laughs> role in the care of underserved patients. And keep that in mind, That's, that continues to be an issue. Thank you.